What is up, guys? Welcome to episode number 138 of Beef's Beef. Got another great interview lined up for you guys. But before we get to that, I want to talk to you about my friend Crystal Lackey at Stockton Mortgage. Hit Crystal up for anything with your home loan needs, your mortgage refinancing, anything in that ballpark, she can help you out. Um, I share her stuff all the time on, on my Facebook. Uh, you see her stuff uh, right before my intro here. So I know you can see it, but I'm still going to give you the phone number anyway. Hit Crystal up at 502-615-0743. Again, it's 502 502- 615-0743. Again, Stockton Mortgage is an equal housing lender. MLS number 8259. Crystal Lackey, MLS number 1735979. Now, again, I promised another great interview, and I'm going to give you another one. This is an interview that is going to have zero to do with sports, but I challenge you to stay and listen because it's a great story. It's one of my good buddies I used to work with uh, at UPS. Uh, we, we met while we were both uh, part-time supervisors. He actually took over my old crew. And uh, my guy's blown up here lately. Uh, has some of his work featured in Time Magazine, uh, The Guardian. Uh, it's been used somewhat uh, internationally as well. Um, he is a, he's a local freelance photographer. Um, and one of my good buddies. So without further ado, my good buddy, John Cherry. What's up, Cherry? How's it going, man? Hey, how's it going, Bleef? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy to hear so many different nicknames, man. I mean, we've known each other since, I guess, what, probably 2011, 2012, man, from UPS. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, long, yeah. strange new world that we were that we're in compared to where we were before. Exactly, man. Back then, we were just peons working on the end up for a big corporation. Now we're both trying to do our own thing, man. Yeah, I know, and getting some some pretty cool notoriety for it too. I know, going from third shift and just checking Mountain Dews to <laughs> trying to change the world. Yeah, exactly, man. So I, I want to give a little bit of background of if you and I. We met at UPS. We were both part time supervisors, but. I mean, I, I think I kind of did that in the intro, but I want to give an intro about you more than anything. So give, give us a background on you. Like, where were you, where were you born? Were you born in Louisville, great, raised in Louisville? What, what, kind of give us a background on you. Yeah, so I was, uh, I was born in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, which is an Army base. Uh, both my parents were military. Um, and so from there, uh, we moved around quite a bit um, in my formative years. Um, we lived in South Carolina, lived in North Carolina, obviously, in my mom's hometown. Um, and then we moved to Fayetteville for a little bit. Um, and we moved to West Virginia for a little bit there. And then we moved to Guam. Wow. And yeah, and Guam was, was pretty wild. When we lived there, we experienced the largest earthquake ever recorded in history up to that point. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was in, in 8.6. And uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty interesting. It was an interesting childhood memory. But um, whenever we lived in Guam, my parents decided to get out of the military. And so we moved back to North Carolina, to my mom's hometown. Um, my father, on the other hand, wanted to like live a little bit closer to his mother who lived in New Albany. So we made the decision to move to, uh, well, they made a decision to move to Louisville. I was just a kid. And uh, so we moved to Louisville and then we stayed there for a couple of years. And then we moved again. We moved to uh, Fairport, New York. Uh, wow. My father picked up, a, picked up a new job. My mom picked up a new job at the Kodak, Kodak plant as an industrial engineer, and then that didn't work out. So a couple of years later, we moved back to Louisville, and I've been I've been here ever since. Nice. So where did you end up attending high school? Um, I actually didn't go to high school. Something maybe you didn't know. I did not know me. that. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was kind of like I don't want to say a bad kid, but I had a lot of trouble in school whenever I was in elementary school. About halfway through fifth grade my parents made a decision to start homeschooling me. And so I was homeschooled from the, that last part of fifth grade all the way up until the end of middle school. And a little bit into that high school, like that, what, what would be like a freshman um, year. And then I started going to JCC, Jefferson Community and Technical College, I guess is what they yeah. call it. Um, and, and a lot of people don't know, you can do dual credit work while you're still in, at high school age. So I was yeah. 15. And I was knocking out my gen ed requirements for college while I was knocking out my uh, my four years of high school at the same time. So when I turned 18, I got an associate's degree and a, and a high school diploma at the same time. 
Well, I have to give your parents credit because you, you can usually tell when someone's homeschooled because they're so socially awkward. And that was <laughs> not anything that I ever – that was – if you would have never told me that, I would have never guessed that you were homeschooled. Yeah, yeah. I used to kind of tout myself as being like the king of the homeschool kids because I was the only one who kind of knew. I mean, I was kind of a little jerk, um, which I think kind of separated me from everybody else. But it was uh, it was an interesting experience. It was uh, it was it was a lot more social than I think a lot of people think being homeschooled mm -hmm. is because like the homeschool groups, like the parents get together. They know that their kids need socialization. They know that they need resources to share because like homeschooling yeah. is really hard. like it's very difficult. Oh yeah. You know, because you're, you're in school while you're at home. You, there's no separation of the two things. So, like, if you don't do the dishes, you got to do stay up and do homework, you know. <laughs> yeah, I never looked at it like that. So, so when you got those two, when you got your diploma and your associate's degree, I guess, is that when you started at UPS? Yeah, yeah, I started. So, I, I actually paid for my own college out of pocket with the help of my parents a little bit. Um, but, yeah, so I started at UPS when I was 18 um, in August of – uh, August of 2007 and um, then from there I, I worked there while I went to UofL and I took a couple of breaks and then I took a really long break after that and I actually still don't have a diploma or, <laughs> I, I'm like 20 credit hours away from graduating but I just never went back yeah so we, I'm judging just from where you you say your your mom went to uh, Kodak to be a an, you say an engineer at, with Kodak yeah yeah so yeah both my parents were engineers uh, my mom was an industrial engineer and an electrical engineer, and my father was an electrical engineer as well, um, and did a lot, a lot of like aeronautics as well. So is that what kind of got you into photography? Yeah, my father was the one who got me into photography. He bought me an old, um, it's, a, it's a brand not a lot of people know about. It's a Korean uh, student film camera. It's called Shinon, C-H-I-N-O-N. Um, got and it's a beautiful, wonderful camera. I still have it. Um, really basic, super simple, and me and him would just go around downtown Louisville and take pictures of stuff, and he would kind of show me how to compose and show me the technical aspects of it, and uh, it was it was a passion for a while, Yeah. Um, and I started, like, uh, working a lot and, like, realized that I liked girls a lot and kind of fell out of it. <laughs> yeah. uh, so what, what age did he get you that camera? Was it I think it was th either 13, 13 or 14, something like that. Yeah, it's... I mean, it's crazy seeing you now because you see the pictures, man, and you can see how at a young age you kind of learned a lot of the things. At least at least that's what I get from it. Because uh, when I saw you start doing it, I thought that was when you had first started doing it. So to, it makes sense now to think, okay, he or to know that you already had that camera at a young age and you already kind of kind of trained yourself almost at a young mm -hmm. age how to do that type of stuff. Yeah, it was um, it, the big breaks kind of started whenever um, digital photography became really popular. And I was, I was kind of had an aversion to digital photography. I thought film is it. Like, you have no skill if you can just take a picture, look at the back of the screen, and then you can say, oh, I can adjust it from here. It's all about getting it home and developing it and then realizing that you just shot 32 shots and you can't get anything out of it. You know, it's like yeah. it was almost like the easy way out. Um, yeah. And so I stayed away from it for a really long time. And then um, I was actually, I started doing it commercially um, after I was a model on a, a beverage shoot for a local, local company. And um, I kind of saw the lights and I saw the cameras. I saw how cool it was, the people that were, you know, directing everything and styling everything. I, like, I, I, I want to do this. I can do this. Yeah. Humble brag too, by the way, with the modeling there. I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I liked yeah. it. So what? So when you guys went downtown, like, was there a certain thing that you kind of focused on trying to uh, photograph, or was it just, hey, whatever was catching your eye? Well, when I'm down there now, it's um, because I've shot so much of it. I have you know uh, 30 days of of photos, um, consecutive days of photos, practically. Um, you feel like you've shot just about everything there is to shoot. And so I was trying yeah. to find something that's a little bit different. But when I initially went down, like the story of when I first went down there was on that night that the um, civil unrest started. I had a good, a good friend of mine, actually my best friend, um, texted me and said, hey, did you hear a bunch of people got shot downtown? And I said, no, I didn't hear about it. He, uh, he said, well, you know, come outside, I'm outside. So I came outside and we hopped in the car and I was like, I should bring my camera, right? He was like, yeah, bring your camera. And we went down there and it was like, it was pandemonium. I've never seen anything like it before. Yeah. You know, we, uh, we came up with a plan when we got kind of close and we saw the, 
the gas and we saw all the police lights and the helicopters and people screaming and yelling and cussing. And um, we got closer to it. We started getting a whiff of the tear gas and started coughing and sneezing and all that. And just kind of realized like, oh, I need to, I need to take pictures of this. Like, this is huge. I don't know what exactly is happening, but it's, this is something that needs to be documented. Absolutely. So my, my style is, since I'm kind of like a landscape, I, 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 I use a lot of different styles. Um, so like, I, I really, really enjoy like wildlife photography, uh, portraiture, landscape, cityscape. I mean, pretty much anything that you can shoot, um, I like to do, but I approach this almost like a landscape photographer. So I wait for, I, I find a nice scene um, that I think will make a good composition. And then I wait for the action to move to that scene. And then that's whenever I start shooting. So somebody starts doing something interesting, and if you notice in a lot of my photos, um, if you get on my website and look at some of the photos I have, that clock tower at City Hall yeah. is oftentimes a main, a main piece in it because I like the look of it. I like how it's kind of like old and it towers above everybody and kind of gives a mood and presence, uh, you know, that the people involved are like a really small part of something that's a lot bigger. So it adds to the mood quite a bit. For sure. So you always hear a lot of photography. This is the saying that I've always heard. A lot of photography is – about having a good eye first off would, would you say that this is something you agree with and if you do what is that something that you feel like can be taught i think it's a really interesting question because um i've known photographers that are very popular and they have a, a huge body of work and they make a ton of money but i haven't felt like they had a had a good eye what, whatever good eye it means like there's um there's like technical composition terms that you can go to school and you can learn, you know, about how to properly compose a photo. But I think that more than having a good eye is having like good situational awareness. Okay. So recognizing that like, you know, this might be an amazing shot, but what's the better shot? A lot of the times you'll see photographers, groups of photographers at a scene and they'll all notice something and they'll all go to the exact same spot to shoot it, which which is great because they're probably all fantastic images, but it's kind of going around them and trying to look around and see what's the other shot. So yeah, I guess having a good eye, having a good eye is a, is a, a real thing, but I think it's maybe it's just having like kind of a different perspective. I feel like it's so, the question is always, or that statement has always been so subjective because there's some music that you and I don't like that someone else sees art in. And maybe that's uh, this, the same way with photography is, like you were saying, there's some people that you don't really feel like have a good eye that are that make tons of money, but in theirs, and then like to them, oh, that's that's what I'm seeing. You know what I mean? It's I, I guess it's it's tough to really answer that on your part because it's so subjective because different people have different eyes, and to them that's good. Well, I think maybe it's not about the eye; it's about how how good of a storyteller do you think? They Absolutely, are? that's the biggest thing that I get from yours is like you can. This, I'm gonna I'm gonna brag on you, and I'm gonna post some of your pictures with the, with this post as well, or at least post a link to your to your website and everything. Look at his pictures because you can literally see in your pictures you can see how much how angry a person is or how hurt a person is in in some of these pictures or how much they just want to be heard. And to me, that was the biggest thing of like I, as soon as you started posting pictures, I, I messaged you and was like, "Hey man, I gotta get you on." Because I like it, if it told me a story, I know it's going to do that for anybody, for everybody else. Yeah, I'm really glad that you found them so impactful too. I've had a lot of people reach out and tell me how how impactful they are. When I go back through them and look at them, like I went through and updated my website yesterday and, and added a whole compendium of them. And it sounds weird, and this is not like a brag on myself, but I was, I was crying looking at all these photos because it was just not just a reminder of that day, but also. You know, it's looking at your own, looking at your own work is strange. It's like hearing your own voice on the radio. I don't listen to my own podcast. I, I, I don't, I've listened to maybe two of my episodes. This is number 138. I've listened to maybe two of my own episodes. I totally get where you're coming from. It's weird. But then when it's you weird. listen to it and you, and you've had other people tell you how great it is, and then you listen to it, you can appreciate it as well, but it's still weird. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. Just, and it's imagine if you, imagine if it wasn't weird. Imagine if you listen to your own voice and you're like, dang, I had a really good point. Yeah. Well, I was really stupid there. You know, that's yeah. kind of what it, that's kind of what it is. Like I try to be as humble and as grounded about it as possible. I also recognize like the work is pretty, pretty incredible. Um, yeah. I think a lot of it has to do with the risk 
that's involved. A lot of those situations, a lot of those like really powerful shots, it's like I'm getting close to super vulnerable moments that other people might not want, want to get close to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you spoke on it just a minute ago. I mean, May 25th, 2020 is a day that I don't think anybody will ever forget. It was the day that George Floyd um, was subjected to the heinous act from the police officers in Minneapolis. And the next day, or I guess it was a few days later, there was a big thing here on that Thursday that you were speaking about. Um, when, when did you realize that, I guess you kind of answered it already, I guess that Thursday, I guess, was when you were like, man, this is really something that I can capture. And not only, I, I, don't, I don't want it to sound selfish or like you're like, yeah, this is something that I can do for myself. Because I, I that's one thing, another thing that I've, I felt with your pictures is I never feel like this for yourself. Like, I feel like it's to show those people that think that every person down there is a thug or every person down there is looting. And it's not, they're not doing that. Yeah. You want to bring up, you want to bring the pure emotion from what's going on down there is what I've always felt like. Yeah. And it's, it's really, it's telling the story and like the full story. And like, if there was like looting or anything happening down there when I was down there, I would more than likely take a picture of it because it's an interesting photo um and try to tr try to speak the truth of what's actually happening down there and the things that are happening behind the scenes yeah. are are really important to me and i know that like i'm part of the movement it's also like i protest and i help with the supply chain and things like that and um i kind of realized that like taking photos was a, a, a great way for me to to um to make an impact it's like my job that's like my job role you know, some people are medics some people are live streamers some people mm -hmm. are the food tents some people are the ones who do all the chalk drawings and and um, help make the brianna square like they keep it organized and clean and i you know document it so. yeah so when, when uh your photos have been featured in a number of places i mentioned it in the intro you've been in time magazine you've been in guardian uh i remember seeing you downtown at the beginning of june uh with a couple of my buddies and you telling me you were excited man and i was pumped for you that day that you told me that you found out you were going to be in time magazine and like explain to everybody on here the feeling you had when you got that news. So Time Magazine and National Geographic features are childhood dreams of mine. When I first got my camera, my, my, that same time, it might've been that same summer, we got that, that film camera from a yard sale. Uh, and then my dad went to another yard sale and got like 60 volumes of National Geographic, which is probably like, it was like 60 years of consecutive of volumes wow and uh, which is probably like worth a fortune now but I, I fell in love with national geographic and it was always a, a dream of mine to like be in that and so like like being in time um is the fulfillment of a childhood dream which not a whole lot of people can say they they have done like dreams come true yeah. um so it was really really emotional for me i mean, when i heard the news i was hanging out on a buddy's porch and i had, looked at my phone i had this email and I was absolutely shocked. And then that shock turned into like, they were like, Hey man, get excited. It's okay. You can be, you can be happy about this. And so then, you know, I ran out in the street and threw my arms up in the air and, 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 and shouted and screamed and it was great. And then whenever I remember, I remember whenever they, you know, we signed the agreement, they featured the work, um, got all the payment details worked out and then it was published and I clicked share on my Facebook to share it with everybody who's a friend of mine on Facebook. And I just started bawling. And I'm not talking like silent crying. I mean like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I just picture, I picture the end of Pursuit of Happiness. That's what I picture. Yeah. You, yeah. Like that's what I picture yeah. is when he finally gets that job and then just like, he just like clapping to himself and crying like that. Like that, yeah. just that raw emotion of like, this is what I've always wanted and it's happening. Exactly. And two, um, you know, my father being a big inspiration and the person that, you know, got me started with this whole thing and I couldn't have done it without him. Um, he passed away about nine years ago. And so it's one of those things of like, if he could see this, if he yeah. could see, you know, where this work was taking me now, like he'd be so proud. So there's kind of a lot of that emotion side of it as well. Absolutely. Uh, so you're, you're also featured in Guardian. And then I didn't know this until I was, you know, I had to do a little bit of research. So I was going through some Facebook stuff to see if there was stuff that I didn't know. And, Obviously, I missed some things because I didn't know you didn't go to high school. Uh, but I saw your mom say that uh, some of your work was featured internationally. Uh, where has where some of your stuff been featured internationally? And uh, how did you hear that Guardian wanted to have you be a part of one of their articles? 
Um, yeah, so the second, the second part, um, the, the Guardian part, I'll address that first. So the Guardian reached out um, and they asked me if I wanted to do a photo essay. And so I had to like Google, like, what is a photo essay real quick? <laughs> and um, they said, yeah, we want you to do a photo essay and like eight to 10 photos that you think would really represent your participation in documenting this movement. Um, and I don't, actually, I don't think they even asked for a photo essay at first. I think I tried to upsell them. They were like, can we feature your photos? And I was like, well, can I like write something? And they were like, oh yeah, we do photo essays. So Google photo essay, <laughs> type something up. Um, and I, taught, I typed up a pretty, a pretty powerful piece about my kind of my description of that first night in addition to um, what the movement meant to me yeah. and the photos. And it really, they came together in a really powerful way. So that was, that was really, I'm really proud of that. Um, and then internationally, um, I had some folks reach out to me a couple of weeks ago uh, with the Kathy Marini Times, which is a Greek newspaper. Wow. Yeah, and they wanted to feature one of my photos on the cover, and then they had a little email interview with me back and forth um, about my thoughts on the thing. So I guess if you are subscribed to the Kathy Marini Times, coming to your doorstep one of these days, I don't know if that's <laughs> That's awesome, though. That's, <laughs> I mean, it's crazy to think that people in – the other side of the world are going to be reading stuff that and seeing stuff that you're doing. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's awesome from, from like my career, my, my body of work perspective, but as far as the movement goes too, that if it's got national attention, what's happening in Louisville and mm -hmm. some of the more messed up things that are happening in Louisville with some of the interactions that people have with police right now, um, you know, if those come to light, I think that's a really big deal. And internationally, if people see what's happening in Louisville, you know, putting our city on the map and really, putting pressure on the city and the state to make some changes and get things Absolutely. done. Yeah. So um, has there been, I guess it's kind of hard to say one, has there been one or a couple of instances that uh, during these protests that stuck with you more than others, or maybe a story that you heard when you were down there or both? Yeah. So Monday, June 15th, and I was just thinking about this date earlier today as a date that I will never forget was the, last it was the last time i was tear gassed and pepper bulleted and all that stuff it was the last like really really serious day outside of the couple of deaths that have happened this week um where the line of lmpd riot police moves to the park and they stopped about a block away um there was a bunch of like i don't know i don't want to say like destruction but there was some mild mild unrest happening a few blocks away with a group of protesters that decided to split off, brought a lot of attention to themselves. And um, somebody got hit by a semi. Um, oh, wow. And, yeah, so that really, really sparked, you know, some outrage there among, among the ranks. I feel um, like that was the same day that the person was inside the building and they shut the pepper bullet at the window. I think that's that the was same day. day. Yep. Yeah. I was underneath that window, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was, uh, I was outside underneath that window. Um, that was one of the main spots that I was shooting from. Um, but yeah, that particular day, there was a, um, or after that, after a lot of that incident kind of cleared up because the police pushed their line all the way down um, 9th Street, and then they pushed it all the way down Jefferson Street until they came to 7th Street, and they stopped at 7th Street. Um, and for anybody who's unaware, the um, 6th Street is where all the protests are. Um, so they were about a block away. Um, and there was one gentleman in particular who was, uh, he was pretty upset with the police presence. He had been shot with some pepper bullets earlier. He was wearing a, uh, he was wearing a Chicago Bulls hat and some sweatpants, and he was wearing a bulletproof vest and no shirt. Um, and he was marching back and forth in front of the police line, shouting all kinds of obscenities at the cops. And this guy was going for a good hour. I mean, he had some pipes on. He was, I mean, he was really late. Yeah. And um, at one point, to calm, him, calm him, come and calm him down, one of the older ladies in the group broke through the line and came up, and she gave him a big hug and whispered in his ear. And that photo I found really impactful because you see in the background this thick black line of, of, of police with their big bear, crap, bear cat um, armored vehicle in the middle. And then you see this really endearing moment where she's trying to get him to calm down so that like no harm, no, or no more harm comes to him. Yeah. And um, yeah, it was just, I mean, it's really, really impactful, beautiful moment. Yeah. And I, I remember that day because I remember that line of police and you could see 
it was crazy because I'm like, there's Cherry right there at the front of everything. Like, he's literally right there. And if you guys watch any Facebook live streams, I don't want to mention anybody's names. I feel like they already know their names anyway just because of the things that have happened the past couple of days. Um, but I, if you watch these Facebook lives or you attend the protests, you're going to see Cherry there. And has there been a time in all this where you felt like you were in danger? Oh, yeah, yeah. There's been plenty of times. Um, there were, you know, I've seen a couple of fights break out at the um, at the protests. Um, I've had cops push right, push me like down to arrest people that were behind me. Because I guess they recognized that I wasn't a threat, but there was somebody who threw something that was behind me. And so when you have like four big cops rushing at you. And yeah. whenever they push you out of the way and you realize that their forearms are padded, like hard padded. Yeah. And that's kind of realization that like, oh man, these guys could really like do some damage if they if they wanted to. Um and I've had like pepper bullets like whiz by me and, and hit me too. I feel like them whizzing by was a little bit scarier because they whiz by at like face level. Um but I've gotten hit in the clothes and I've gotten hit in like the backs of the legs and stuff. Um the big rubber bullets, the big green rubber bullets that they shoot, you know, you can you they're they move slow enough that you can see them, but they're still moving at a pretty good pace and so you know, having those go, go by you, fortunately, I haven't gotten hit by any of those. But, yeah, there's been some – when they try to do their crowd control tactics, it, it's pretty it's pretty alarming. But most of the time, I don't really feel that afraid. Yeah. Uh, feel it's just more, I guess, more alert, I guess, than anything. Yeah. Yeah, it's more of, like, unafraid. Um, I, it's funny. I was talking to my therapist about it. I was asking her, like, what is this? Why do I feel so unafraid? <laughs> uh, like, is, that, is there something wrong with me? Should I be freaking out? But – sounds like it's just you know concentrate on one thing and then you do it well and then you freak out afterward when i get in my car is usually when i'm like oh I can't you're like that. what the heck did i just go through like what what just happened like yeah, i'm sure that first day when it, situations oh yeah i'm sure that first day when you got back in your car that friday or even that thursday you got back in your car and you were like what what did i just see absolutely yeah it's like what is happening what is what is going on in the, in the city right now seeing such a militarized police force that like, I, I didn't even know these guys had all this stuff. Yeah. You know, they, and they were ready. So yeah, that was, uh, that was, that was an eye opening night. Well, even was. what's even crazier about that is there's things that I, even more that I didn't know that they have. And I was listening to a podcast, uh, not, not too long ago that had the attorney for David McAtee on it. And he mentioned I don't know if you know this. Did you know that St. Matthew's Police Department has their own tank? I did not know that. I did not know that either. And I don't, I don't think that this attorney would put his name on the line to come out on a podcast, a pretty popular podcast, and just say that. Um, I'll, I'll have to send you that podcast because the dude that does the podcast, I'm not the biggest fan of, but the fact that he had this guy on there, it, it was it's like an hour long, but it's a very good podcast. That's nuts. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. Um, um, can we, can we time out real quick? Just yeah. cause I have, um, I think my phone is about to die. Yeah. So can I try to do it on her, um, iPad and then we continue? Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned some stuff about like National Geographic and time being like a dream of yours. Is there somebody locally that you would consider someone you look up to or like a mentor for photography? Um, yeah, for photography, I would definitely say if somebody I see out all the time at the protest too, and I was just checking out his work. His name is Eric Branch. He's also a black photographer. Does a lot of does a lot of portraiture, uh, like fine art, editorial things like that. And had to pivot his career in a way that I kind of did to, to document the protests and contribute to the movement in that way. His work is fantastic. He's a great guy. He's got a lot of really good advice and has kind of hooked me up with some folks. And I hooked him up with some of the younger crowd too. And and so like it's uh it's it's cool to. Uh, it's what about cool. who would you say nationally? Is there somebody nationally that you look up to that you kind of say that's something I could take something from, or that's somebody that I admire or that I would like to be like? Um, yeah. So I, I believe he's passed away now, but there's a, a photographer by the name of um, David LaChapelle, who is a um, fine art photographer. Mm -hmm. um, I've always admired his work and it was all kind of like wacky and weird and a little bit obscure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And then um, Annie Leibovitz, also is a fantastic photographer, very well-renowned, world-renowned fine art photographer. 
Um, Ansel Adams is the one that most, I think, people know of is pretty much the pioneer of landscape photography. And uh, yeah, I'd say those are probably like three of the really big ones I can name off the top of my head. So would you say that photography is something that your ultimate goal is to have a career in? Or what would you say, I guess, is your ultimate goal with photography? Uh, well, ultimate goal of photography would be to um, make enough money off of it to sustain me, which I'm currently doing. Um, and then to be able to teach as well, which I already do teach and I take mentorship. Um, like I take mentees, I guess is what they're called. Yeah. Uh, I mentor folks on it. Um, like before COVID shut down, I would set aside Sunday, like Sunday morning would be for like mentor sessions. Um, and then Sunday evening would be for portrait sessions for, for, for like actually like shooting to make money. But the mentor sessions were free. It was just, I would give somebody one of my extra cameras and we would go around and I'd just kind of teach them basics of composition and technique and, and some of the technical aspects of it. Um, but yeah, I would like to have like my own studio, a shared space um, where I can teach people how to do exactly those things that I learned how to do in, in the way that I do them. Do you, do you feel like the people that mostly come to your classes are younger or an older crowd or is it just a mix? So I feel like stuff, like I found stuff that whenever I was a kid, that I thought was so nerdy and I didn't want to do that now I'm super interested in? Well, I think I bring, I think I bring something to the table to make it a little bit more, more interesting. Like I have kind of my own language about speaking about photography that I don't really see a whole lot of people teaching it in a certain way. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of lewd and I like joking around a lot, <laughs> um, which is another thing you don't really see a whole lot is like it's photography is really serious. A lot of times it's really serious. It's not about, being curious it's not about exploring and it's not about storytelling it's about just like getting the shot the perfect shot every single time um so yeah i'd say it's it's i'd say it's probably people in their mid-20s mid to late 20s yeah about my age i'm 30 so it's usually just slightly younger than me yeah so man more than anything dude i told you a couple of times i appreciate you taking time out and coming on but um outside of taking pictures of the protests which are which is immensely important what other things are you working on um outside of protest stuff i still have like a pretty bustling freelance career a lot of it is more bustling because now I'm, I'm published and i can add those credentials to my to my website um today i just got done with a shoot for wood magazine which is a woodworking instructional magazine um which i'm also interested in woodworking as well and i've got a shop in my garage um I'm a big cook. I love cooking. Um, that's probably, it's not something I'm going to make money off of unless I open a <laughs> restaurant, which is another childhood dream. So, um, I think that in my day to day, um, isn't really changed a whole lot. I've been taking a break from the, from the, uh, from the protest this week, just because of a couple of, of, uh, deaths that have been down at the square near the square, um, this, this past week. But I, uh, uh um, like moving forward, I'm definitely looking to do more editorial stuff, more stuff for magazines, more photo essays, uh, really striking while the iron's hot. And if there's anybody who wants something covered, freelance, um, events, weddings, portraiture, wildlife, landscapes. Um, I've started selling a lot of prints lately. Mm -hmm. um, I'm planning on, I'm not sure if I should talk about this, I'm planning on going on taking a, a, a gallery opening and then possibly taking that and making it into like a national tour. Nice. Well. So that'll be taking up a lot of my, it's already taken up a ton of my time. The logistics yeah. behind something like that is huge, well, but yeah. Is it, isn't it crazy though, man? Cause this is taking up a lot of my time, but it doesn't feel like work because it's something you like to do. I don't know if it feels like it with you. Like it doesn't feel like work to me because I enjoy it so much. Yeah. It's the labor of love. You yeah. can't, it just, it just, the days go by super quick. And you wake up feeling refreshed and you go to bed really tired and you just can't, this is like the, the things that we're, that we're supposed to do when you, when yeah. you're in a place that you, that you know, you're supposed to be there, everything just kind of comes, comes to, uh, comes to play in such a smooth way. Absolutely. So I want you to, to plug everything, everything that you can plug, man, plug your social media pages, plug your okay. website, everything, put it on here. And then I want you to text them to me too, so I can put them on the on the thing for the web or for the podcast as well so where can everybody reach out on social media pages yeah you got it brother um well my website is cherry tree imagery.com uh my instagram handle is john p cherry so it's j-o-n p cherry um 
my Facebook. You can add me. I'm John Cherry on Facebook. I'm the guy who looks like me in my <laughs> profile picture. Pretty easy to spot. Yeah. Um, if you got, I have a style index profile now too, which is pretty cool. It's for like world famous talent in whatever their industry is for ad agencies to just go through and find like, Oh, we need a guy in Louisville who's a fine art photographer in Louisville and they can just go through and it's like, it's open to the public for review, but to nice. contact you have to be like a big agency. So it's cool to check it out. I've got some cool work on there. Um, and if like, if you all want to go to my website and check it out, I just updated it. So it's ready for you. Um, but yeah, that's how you can reach out to me and I'd really appreciate a message or any feedback from anybody who wants to. So, yeah, absolutely, man. And man, I know you've been busy cause it's, we've had to change two or three days, but I, I told you every time, man, that you're taking time out for me. So I, I'm never going to get upset with it, man. I appreciate you taking time out and talking to me. Yeah. I'm really honored to be on here. And, and I know that you have a pretty good viewership and a loyal view, viewership and, um, you know, I think that some of my opinions and some people's opinions about the, the movement are are not always going to align with each other. And so, yeah. you know, you, you, you're kind of taking a risk by having somebody who's like pro movement. <laughs> no, I don't and, I don't consider that at all, man. I don't consider that being a risk. That's awesome. uh, I, I, I really don't, man. I don't, I don't really feel like the statements that have come from it are really a political movement or a movement or anything. I think it's a life movement. And Absolutely. to me, I, I've told everyone from the very beginning that my podcast will never get political. And that's why I don't, that's why I didn't fear having you under because it's not political. It's about having people. It's about living. It's about loving each other. That's never a political thing to me. So that's, I, I wanted to make sure that no, it's not political at all. It's nothing it's about solid, the yeah, movement. I, I it's, think, it's not political. I think your head's in the right place about it. And I think that you are on the, the right side of history because I know that some folks wouldn't want to have, you know, somebody on that is, is pro movement and you wouldn't be so staunchly pro movement too. And I've seen you down there too, if you didn't think it was absolutely the right thing to do. So I, I really appreciate that. I appreciate you having me on and taking the time out to put a highlight on, on me and my career. Absolutely, man. I, it's, it's the beginning for you, man. I know you said time magazine's your dream, but the stuff you do, man, it's going to go way beyond that. I can already tell. Yeah, I, uh, I hope so. I feel like I haven't had my fill yet. It's been great, but I haven't <laughs> yeah. had my fill yet. For sure, man. But, man, I don't want to take up any more of your time. You got plenty of stuff to get to do. So, man, I appreciate it again. Thanks for coming on, man. Hey, thanks again. Absolutely, man. Appreciate Have a good you. one.